Last year, I, uh, I had the pleasure of going to a, a Soho theater and seeing Baba Brinkman and thinking how bad it would have to be to follow him. <laughs> I tell you, <ya. laughs> I think I'm pretty sure he gave my entire talk. But, <laughs> and he did it in a very short period of time. So, as Jack was saying, I, I, as many of you probably know, I, I really would like to make a dinosaur. <laughs> and, uh, and I've wanted to make a dinosaur my whole life, but it never occurred to me that we actually could until Michael Crichton came along. <laughs> and it seemed very reasonable. So I thought, you know, we could just go out and get ourselves some amber and just try it out. <laughs> well, that didn't work. It works great in the movies, though. We also went out and tried to do it with a dinosaur. We actually went out and dug up a dinosaur, and, and we found some really cool stuff in it. We actually found uh, proteins and, and, and soft tissues. I mean, it was, we, we found a few things, but but we weren't able to make a dinosaur. So, so we have to try something different. And, of course, evolution works, according to Baba, right? It works. So there are some tools in evolution. So we want to talk about that. But before I get into that, I, I really want to make sure everybody's on the same page. And so evolution is descent with modification. I assume you all know that. But the most important thing to know about it is that basically our offspring are different from the parents, right? That's the only difference. I mean, that, that is evolution. You are different than your parents. There are no greater changes in evolution than those between parents and their offspring. So that's good to keep in mind because there's a lot of people out there that think that Somewhere along this way, up, up pops something brand new, and that doesn't happen. I'm sure that sometimes people think that their offspring have <laughs> mutated, <laughs> and they have mutated, but, but sometimes we think that those mutations are a little greater than they are. So if we, if we look at, if we just think about this as generations, here we see four generations of women, and if we think about a human generation as being 20 years, then um, we're looking at 80 years, and so we can make a little mark for each generation. And so you can see here that, you know, after 50 generations, we have a thousand years. And when we're thinking about differences between um, a, a, a child and its mother, or a child and its grandmother or great-grandmother, obviously they have less characteristics in common as we get further away. So after 50 generations, there's a lot of difference. And if we think about 3,000 generations, 69,000 years, obviously between the first one and the last one, it's going to be a great amount of difference. But is it enough for a species change? Not really. And what does it take? Well, we don't really know. We haven't got a clue because it's pretty subjective how different someone might have to be. I mean, 10,000 human generations takes us back 207,000 years. We're definitely, we would think we had a mutation if we instantly ended up with, with someone that looked like they would have looked 207,000 years ago. But when we think about where we actually have new species, we have to go 400,000 years, 20,000 generations. But we don't, you know, obviously somewhere in between those 20,000 generations, somewhere in there, we would say someone is different enough looking that they might be a new species. And that really is what it's all about. So, so when we think about Darwin and his, I call them proofs of 
evolution. Um, in science, we usually call them hypotheses, but they are proofs. The geological record is a really good one. And, and what we see in the geological record really is very primitive animals in the oldest rocks and more derived animals in the, and plants in the uh, more younger rocks. And as a scientist, if I could go out and find a dinosaur in 600 million year old rocks, I would disprove the theory of evolution. I would be the most famous scientist that ever lived. And lots of people say, well, you know, scientists are, they actually find these things, but they sweep them under the rug. Well, I can assure you we don't. <laughs> I would like to be the most famous scientist that ever lived. <laughs> well, I haven't found a dinosaur down there, and I've looked. So when we look at these, these animals from 300 million years ago, you know, it's, it's kind of, they're cool. You know, you can, you can find some, like shrimp at the top, that evolved a long time ago and before 300 million years ago, and they look pretty much the same. The sharks are a little bit different and obviously have changed quite a bit. And here's this funny little thing down here in the right-hand corner. We haven't got a clue what that is. We've never seen anything like it. We don't even know which way's up. <laughs> and as you get further back in time, things get weirder. And then pretty after some, you know, there are some things that back there are ways we don't know not only which way's up, but we don't know which way's frontwards, backwards, or if it even has a frontwards or backwards. So, so as you get further back in time, you find weirder things. I work on dinosaurs. I try to stay in the less weird stuff. Another proof is selection, and selection is a cool thing too. I mean, just think, if selection didn't work, we wouldn't have these, whatever they are, these. <laughs> Never mind, Na Naomi is actually a human, we know that, but, <laughs> but people started with a wolf, and then they bred to those things. And the, the little white thing with the ribbon in its hair, I mean, if you look at it, it really, it's very close to what a fetal, a fetal coyote would look like, or a wolf. So they've basically bred back to having fetal animals. This, this thing on the right, this bulldog, we don't know what that, it, that really doesn't look like anything. <laughs> I mean, look at it. It's, it's lowered, I mean, it's... Let's put it this way. If we genetically engineered something like that, they'd throw us in jail. <laughs> but about breeding, you know, breeding takes a long time. And so it's taken thousands of years to get these weird looking animals. Another one of the proofs are rudimentary features, and I'm sure you all know. Flightless birds can't fly, and yet they have wings, or at least they have semblance of, ring, of, of wings. And then there's the eyes of blind mole rats. They have eyes, but they don't work. And the hind legs of whales that are buried deep inside. So rudimentary features are, are certainly evidence of evolution. But the thing that I'm mostly interested in are these things called atavisms. Atavisms are these throwbacks, these characteristics that show up every once in a while. Children are born occasionally with tails. And, well, the genetic pathway is still there. Just so happens that some other things are born with tails, and we'll get to those. And dolphins and snakes born with, with legs. So atavisms are very interesting features in evolution because... Atavisms are characteristics of their ancestors. And every once in a while they pop out. And I'm into trying to get them to pop out. So imagine after 82,000 generations, as you can imagine, just following one parent back, 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 and back, get back in here somewhere, and then imagine 
this going forward again with all the children of each. When people talk about the geological record being incomplete, they are absolutely right. In order for it to be complete, you would have to have every single organism of every single generation that ever lived on this earth. And I'll bet most of you can't find your great-great-great-grandfather. So we're not going to find them all. All right, so descent with modification implies relatedness. And we can check out relatedness. We can actually demonstrate relatedness genetically. I don't know whether you know, but crocodilians are more closely related to birds. Alligators and crocodiles are more closely related to birds than either of them are to lizards and snakes. Doesn't make sense, right? Because most people think lizards and snakes and crocodiles are all cold-blooded, therefore they're more closely related. But that's not true, and we can check it by genetics. So genetics is actually the test proof of evolution. Now, when it comes to dinosaurs, we can look at their similarities and we can tell that they're all related to one another. We can look at their differences to see how much variation there is. And the animals that I'm interested in are these things, velociraptor-like things, very popular with children these days. <laughs> and when I tell people I want to make a dinosaur, of course, this is exactly what they want. They don't want a plant eater that's friendly. They want one of these things. But the cool thing about these dinosaurs is that they share characteristics with birds. And they share lots of characteristics like uh, oblong eggs and hard-shelled eggs and the wishbone, three-toed foot, feathers, hollow bones. They basically show that dinosaurs invented every every characteristic that we think of as bird characteristics. So that's pretty cool. So basically what that means is that when we look at the shared characteristics of these animals, what it means, of course, is that birds are dinosaurs. So we don't have to make a dinosaur. We already have them. <laughs> but do you think the sixth graders like that idea? <laughs> no. No, they don't like that at all. So, basically, this kind of dinosaur gave rise to that kind of dinosaur. And so, we actually have dinosaur DNA. So, what we're trying to do in Montana in our lab is actually reverse evolution and try to take this animal and turn it into that one. And it's interesting. It's interesting trying to do this. Because when you look at them, Really, the differences, when, you're, when, you, when you think about the differences, it's the tail, right? I mean, the Velociraptor is cool looking. It's got a tail. It's got hands with claws. And the bird doesn't. <laughs> now, kids would like to see, obviously, they think if I'm going to make a dinosaur out of a bird, I should use a big bird. And, and I tell them, well, that's nice, but actually chickens are easier to come by. <laughs> so, so this is what we're doing. We're actually going to turn, we're basically going to turn a chicken <laughs> into a dinosaur. <laughs> now. I know it just doesn't sit right with you. I mean, I, there's a lot of people that just think this probably won't work very well. But on the other hand, the cool thing is, is that people already have made some progress in this. There's a guy named Matthew Harris that actually was able to generate teeth in chickens, in birds. So we know that that's an atavism. That's an atavistic character. They used to have them. Their ancestors had teeth and they're able to get them back in the talpid chicken. So, so that's pretty cool. In our lab in Montana, we are, um, we are working on looking at embryos. And basically what we do is we look for atavisms as the embryo is developing just to see 
what characters we might be able to bring back. And basically what we do is we, is we open an egg while the embryo is developing inside. We go in, we extract some RNA, we make what is called a probe, and then we go back into the egg and we put that probe in there and then we can tell um, by a dye that we use, um, we can tell where certain things are happening. And what we're looking for are places where the arms are starting to grow, the wing, or where the tails are starting to grow. And we're looking for the right genes. And what we're interested in actually doing is stopping the growth. So we know that Velociraptor hand looks like this. We know Archaeopteryx, the early bird, looks like that. And a pigeon looks like that. And it doesn't look very good. We need to fix that. And so here's how we fix it. This is the embryonic hand. So the embryonic hand looks pretty good. So we're looking for the gene that turns that into that. And we're going to stop that from happening. So we can hatch out an animal, a chicken, with a three-fingered hand. And then we're doing the same thing with a tail. We find a place where the tail is starting to develop. A gene turns on, flips it off. So. Basically, this is what we're trying to do. Take a chicken, make it a dino chicken. <laughs> and it's cooler looking. It's really cooler looking. Isn't that a cooler looking chicken? <laughs> we think our first generation, our first generation dino chicken will probably look pretty much like a chicken with hands and a tail. It doesn't look too cool yet, but, but <laughs> as we progress, we're hoping for a little bit more. And hopefully, with any luck, we can actually get to a point where we have something that looks a little more like a dinosaur, but it's further down the road. But of course, everybody keeps telling me now, the kids love it, the kids love it. And all the adults always say, what about Jurassic Park? <laughs> you know, we had a problem in Jurassic Park. Those little dino cute little dinosaurs hatched out, and then they conspired when they grew up. <laughs> and as we know, dinosaurs love to eat guys, <laughs> especially lawyers. I don't know if you ever watch those movies, you'll notice that they only eat men. <laughs> no children or women are ever eaten by dinosaurs. Thank you very much. <laughs>